Thanks, Dr. Andy Haslam. Good morning and welcome. Um, let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer, and then we'll get into worship and come back for the word. Um, Father God, I just thank you for this morning. Um, I thank you that we get to gather in a place to worship you and to praise you and to set aside the cares of the world for a little bit here and to focus ourselves upon you, Lord. I know life gets busy for so many of us. Um, and I pray that this morning for the next, I don't know, hour, hour and a half, um, that we would just kind of sit back and allow all of those things to be washed away and that we would focus ourselves upon you, that Holy Spirit, you would do a work in our hearts and our minds, um, that you would transform us, that you would mold us and shape us, that you would help us to put off things that are not of you and put on the things that are, um, that you would continue to encourage us and comfort us, guide us and lead us um, in everything that we do, that when we leave this place, that we would be better prepared and better equipped and uh, more emboldened to go out and to share the truth of your gospel with people that we know, the people that we interact with throughout the week. Um, lead us and guide us here this morning, Holy Spirit, as only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Angels and saints, we sing worthy are your name. And that's why I sing your praise. Forever be all praise. Ever be all praise. Your praise will ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. I will take to the secret place, just in all to embrace. Love is found here in our sacred space. I hear your voice, I see your face. And you're still my first love. a table just for you and me break the bread and pour the wine perfect union nothing in between I am yours and you are mine and you
so free of the embers in my heart. Then it is a flame, and let it burn, let it burn. Oh, free of the embers of my heart. Then it is a flame, and let it burn, let it burn. Oh, free of the embers of my heart. Then it is. Shipping the nuance of your name. 
is that you get all of our love, that there's no hidden things that we have, Lord, but it's all just there and it's out before you, because you're so much greater than everything else, Lord. We've tasted and seen of this sweet love that we get with you, Jesus, and we just praise you and we thank you for that because you're good. Lord, we don't deserve your love, and yet you give it to us, and so often we don't give you our love when you deserve it all. Lord, would you just work that in our hearts? Would you work it in our hearts to give you all of our love? Not just here, as we're here on Sunday and we're supposed to be worshiping you, but everywhere in our lives, because that's when we're supposed to be worshiping you too. Lord, would we stop getting up from the altar? Would we just be a sacrifice, a living sacrifice on the altar for you, Lord? Off of the foundation of your love for us, would we love you? Jesus, we thank you for your love. We praise you because you're good. And we're not lost anymore. We're found by the King of Kings. And you're the worthy King of Kings, Jesus. And you you deserve all of our love, all of our adoration, all of our attention. And so often our eyes are on all of these other things, Jesus. So would our eyes just be fixed on you this morning? And would we not lose sight of who you are and your love? Would you put a desire in our hearts to love you better? Again, good morning and welcome. A uh, couple of announcements this morning um, before we get started um, with the message. Just want to kind of make you aware of. Um, there's a woman's Bible study starting this Thursday, the 13th at 7 p.m. So um, if you're interested in that Bible study, if you have other questions, you can see Janet Dunstan. Um, and she'll be able to go ahead and get you that information. But otherwise, Thursday night, 7 o'clock here at the church. Um, ladies, you're all welcome to come and attend that. Um, there's a financial board meeting following service today. So probably 20 minutes after service today, if you're interested in the finances of the church, 
can meet us in the conference room, um, and that'll be there and open to anybody who wants to come. Um, Wednesday night, seats time is going on again, again, at 6.15. The adults who were in that class, if you did not get a book, please let me know, um, and then I can get you a book. They'll be in tomorrow, so I'll, I'll find some way to connect with you in the next couple days to get you a book um, so you can go ahead and catch up with the, with the study that's going on. Um, but we're going through session two and going through and answering those questions. I pray that those who have been there are all kind of been working on their memorization. Um, there's been a challenge been put out, right? And we, I feel it's necessary, right? We've been talking about spiritual disciplines, and the first week comes in, and this first um, session of the Bible study comes in, and it's talking about memorization. And so there's a challenge out there to memorize First John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. Um, so that's what we were working on this week, and so I just pray that you've been spending some time being purposeful and intentional about doing that um, and preparing yourself. And then also there'll be a youth lock-in this upcoming Saturday, October 15th, starting at 3 o'clock. Um, that's for anybody ages 13 through 18. That basically, I think it's like 8 through 12 um, grades, if you will. If you have any questions, you can see Phil or Amanda Knapp. Um, but they'll be meeting here at the church um, Saturday the 15th at 3 p.m. And so with that, um, we're going to continue our series this morning on the, on the series of godliness. And we had talked about it last week, about being two different aspects of this series. Right? We have a series kind of mixed with the fruit of the Spirit, the character of God becoming like Christ, and then also the spiritual disciplines that lead to that effect. Right? These, these practices, these habits that we put ourselves into and put ourselves through, whether that's Bible reading, prayer, fasting, solitude, there's a list of them out there. If you ever were to Google it, you can find this long list, and the lists are all a little different. Um, but there's some core ones that we're going to look at as we go through this series, um, and to encourage one another to put into practice. And as I was reading this week, just through some different um, books, some different studies on spiritual disciplines, and I'll share some of the quotes with you here this week, this morning, is the fact that spiritual disciplines, I think, are a little different than what many of us have made them out to be. Right? Spiritual disciplines are actually just a, a practice of putting ourselves in a place, putting ourselves in the presence of God so that the Holy Spirit can work in our lives, that he can transform us. Right? It's, it, it's putting ourselves in a position, right? slowing down from the busyness of the world, and positioning ourselves where the Holy Spirit can come in and do some work. And I guess, as my guess is, every one of us in this room has need for the Holy Spirit to do work in our life. Right? We just do, right? We're not, we're not Christ-like yet. We're not perfect yet. We're not blameless yet. And so there's work for him to do in our lives. We're not perfectly loving. We're not perfectly at peace. All the fruits of the Spirit that we'll look at here. Um, you know, and so I, I just want to encourage you, right, so as we get into some of these disciplines, we won't get into one this week. We'll get into the first one next week on that side. But as we get into the disciplines, I really encourage you to start to practice. I don't, don't look at them and blow them off and go, ah, whatever, I don't have time. There's exactly part of the problem. Right? If we don't have time for a relationship with the Lord, what are we doing? Right? If we're not coming here in this place here this morning to come in to grow and to mature and to learn about Christ and to worship Christ and our Father and, and, you know, and have our lives change, what are we doing? Right? Church isn't about us coming to be entertained or anything like that. Church is to come together and to, to worship our Lord and to be encouraged and changed and built up and transformed into the image of Christ. Right? It's to be challenged in our walk and in our faith with Christ. And so I pray that that's why you've been coming to church and why you'll continue to come through this series on um, God, becoming godly. And 1 Timothy 4, 7 was, was kind of our launching point um, last week. And so just kind of a reminder, Paul tells Timothy, train yourself in godliness. Discipline yourself in godliness. And that godliness is this idea of a, of a devotion to God, a devotion to becoming like Christ, that ends up resembling and showing itself in a life that looks like Christ. Right? And so that's what godliness starts to be. And so we're going to go through this this morning. We're going to hit the first one of the fruits found in Galatians chapter 5, and that's love. And I sat here and I'm like, let's see, I've done a series on love. We spent 26 weeks on love. My guess is most of you, if you've been in the church any duration of time, have heard a ton on love, and I'm like, God, where do we go with this whole thing? I'm like, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what else to say about the topic in some regards. Right? You can't really exhaust the topic, right? but at the same time, I don't know that I can do it any more justice than what the scriptures can do. Right? And so this morning, I hope you have your thumbs ready, because we're going to read a ton, and that's why I kind of put the insert in your, bullet, in your bulletin. That way you don't have to take notes. Right? So all the verses we're going to look at are in there. But we're going to look at those verses because I believe that, you know, in Romans, Paul says that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And I know he's talking about faith, that, that initial faith, that salvation faith comes. But I believe our faith continues to grow as well as we hear the truth of the word. And then if we look in, in Ephesians, and I think it's somewhere, Ephesians 4, 11, 12, somewhere in that vicinity, right, he talks about the fact that the word is alive and active. 
And so I'm going to trust and I'm going to pray, and I've been praying all week, that God's word would do the work, that, it, that it's his word that goes through, that's alive, that goes in and penetrates and divides joints and marrow, right? soul, flesh, and I mean, it does the work in our lives. And do we let the word of God do that work in our lives? Which is part of the reason for spiritual discipline. Are we putting the word in? Are we spending time with the word being Jesus in prayer? Are we, you know, are we allowing that to happen? Are we fostering that connection? And so when we start to look at agape love, um, first John, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, just kind of refresh ourselves on a weekly basis here of the fruit that we're talking about, of the character traits we're putting in. Galatians 5, starting in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And against these things there is no law. There's nothing hindering those things. Go and do those things as much as you possibly can. And so the first one is love. And that doesn't mean that love is, I don't know, more important or higher than any of the rest. But love is where I believe all the rest of them start to come out of. Genuine love for God and genuine love for each other is where some of this other stuff comes into play and, you know, comes into practice. And so this is love, if agape love, if you've been with us any duration of time, is seeking the highest good of the person being loved. Seeking the highest good. Not just emotions, not just sentiments, not just, hey, I love you, not just... No, it's seeking the highest good, and sometimes that highest good can be tough love. And sometimes that highest good means that we have to be willing to confront things in their lives that aren't necessarily very comfortable to confront. But love does that. Because their highest good is that they become Christ-like, no? Is that not the highest good in every one of our lives, is that we would become like Christ? I believe it is. That is, that is the absolute highest good that there is, is that we become like Him. That's His purpose and intent for our lives, is that we would reflect Him. And so we have to allow that to be the case in our lives. And so another way to look at agape love is it's a pure, willful, sacrificial love that intentionally desires another's good. Intentional. And I've talked about it many times over the course of years, right? Love looks like something. It always looks like service to your neighbor. Always. Right? If God sat in heaven and goes, you know, I love you, and never sent his son, would we believe him? What, what, what's there to believe him? Right? There, there's, no, there's been no proof. There's no evidence of this love that he says he has. And unfortunately, too often, maybe in our own lives, right, we do a lot of speaking about how we love one another. But is there practical application of that love? Is there evidence that that love is true? Are we willing to sacrifice for one another? And that can look like a, like a million things. Right? That can look like time. That can look like resources. That, I mean, little things, big things. Are we willing to sacrifice? Because love does. Love sacrifices all the time, and we'll see that as we go through here this morning. And so agape love is always a choice to love somebody and to seek their highest good, and regardless of the cost it is to us. Jesus didn't consider the cost. If the Father says, you know what, I love these people so much that I'm sending my son, what cost is that? I mean, there, there is no higher cost than sending your son to die for people who are your enemies. And so God goes... I'm willing to pay that. I don't care. This is how much I love people. This is how much I desire them to be in my kingdom and desire to be in relationship with them. I'm sending my son. The utmost sacrifice. And yet we so often find it hard to sacrifice 10 minutes maybe to sit with a brother or sister. And we're like, no, no, my life is just too busy. I don't have time. Okay. <laughs> sure. Right? I think every one of us here this morning is grateful that God didn't go, well, I don't have time. That Jesus didn't go, you know what, God, I, you know, Father, I... I get it, these people, but I just don't really have time to do that. I'm just, I'm, I'm busy. Jesus didn't do that for us. And so we have to be reminding ourselves that that's who we're becoming. And so we have to allow ourselves to be challenged and to make that kind of sacrifice and make that choice to move forward. This word is listed over 200 times in the New Testament alone, right, between its noun and its verb form. And we're not going to look at all 200, but we're going to look at a pretty good chunk of them here this morning. And we're going to allow the word, and we're going to pray that the word would take that truth that we're going to hear about and then allow it to penetrate our hearts and build this character in us. Does that sound like a plan? I hope so. Let's pray real quick for that, for that effort. Father God, we just thank you for this morning. I thank you for the truth of your word. Um, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would take these words and you would use them to penetrate hearts and minds. You would really use them to change our lives, God. That you would do the work in us that only you can do. I pray that these words would, would have life in them. Lord, that as we speak truth, that we would set people free, that people would experience your love and your kindness and your goodness, that they would in turn then go ahead and live out these things 
as they leave this place one to another and to others in their circles of influence in their schools in their homes in their workplaces lord that these things would live out of us and we would have a desire to do them and to walk in them holy spirit would you empower us in that endeavor in jesus name we pray amen and so if you look in your bulletin there you've got the insert like i said you don't have to write all these down because i'm probably going to go a little faster because i mean we could be here quite a while if we take too much time but i don't want to have to have you being paying attention to writing verses down I want you to be able to look in your Bible, and I want you to be able to see them with your eyes, and I want you to be able to just, maybe just take a time at, at some point and just listen. Right? Allow the Word of God to penetrate, and ask the Holy Spirit to take that Word and to change your life. And so, the first one we're going to look at is God's love for us. Right? God's immense love for us. And obviously we can go to John 3.16 right out of the gate, um, you know, and, and, and realize that His love gives sacrificially. Right? John 3.16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish but have eternal life, right? And so maybe right out of the gate we get to look at that verse and go, wow, spiritual discipline, we can put it into memorization. If you've been in the church for any duration, good chance you have that verse memorized. So we do have the ability to memorize scripture. Maybe it takes some effort, maybe it takes a lot of repetition, but we have that. And we see that God gives sacrificially. He gives his son. And then slide with me to the book of 1 John. So go from the Gospel of John and slide over to the book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. And we'll be in the book of 1 John for a little bit here. 1 John 3. This is all about God's love for us. Verse 1. 1 John 3, 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Right? See what kind of love the Father has given to us. Where were we without Christ, without the Father? Sending his son to die. Lost, without hope in a world, correct? Hopeless. And now he goes, look at the kind of love the Father has lavished on you, has poured on you, has given to us, that we might be called sons and daughters of God. Who does that? Right? Our Father does that. He pours out his love on us. And if you slide down over to chapter 4, we'll see God's love again. John chapter 4, or 1 John chapter 4, sorry. Starting in verse 9. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. In this the love of God was made manifest among us. Right? There's the importance of love being an action, of love being a choice, of God himself going, you know, I'm not just going to speak I love you. I'm not just going to tell you I love you. I'm going to manifest my love for you. I'm going to make it real. I'm going to make it personal. I'm going to make it something that you can, you know, kind of touch, if you will. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. Verse 10, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Right? If God so loved us that he made a choice to send his Son then what is our issue with loving each other? He goes, if you've experienced this love, if you've, if, if you've received this love into you from the Father, that this lavish love that God has poured out by sending His Son, then not model that. Copy that. Follow the example that Christ has laid out for us, that our Father has laid out for us. He goes, if you've received that love, pour it back out so that other people too can receive it. Right? So God pours his love out to us on a consistent basis. And he bottles it and he demonstrates it. He's not asking you and I to do something he hasn't already done. But our Father and our Lord Jesus right, never does that. He doesn't command us to go do something without first telling us what, we, what he has done and modeling it for us. He's not like, go ahead and sacrifice your life for people that, you know, that's love. Go and sacrifice for them. But I'm not doing it for you. He goes, no, no, no. Look, I'm going to show you what it looks like. I'm going to demonstrate what love truly does. Now, can you copy that? And of course, in our flesh, in our, in our, in our worldly sense, we're never going to copy that. <laughs> that this flesh, this, this unrenewed flesh, isn't able to. It's not possible. We can't love like that apart from the Spirit. Why? It's a fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit works this love into you and to me. But He takes God's love and puts it in. So let's go ahead and book, flip over to the book of Romans. Right? Maybe you're already kind of catching ahead. There's one in there that I did not put down. I forgot to. Romans chapter 5. Still on God's love for us. Still on what the Father demonstrated for us. What he's asking us to model after. 
by showing us how much he loves you and me. First, or Romans chapter 5. And then you look at verse 5, and he's talking about trials in verses 1 through 3, and he's like, you know, we're supposed to rejoice in these, and we're supposed to be excited because we know these trials are producing in us some endurance and some character and hope. And then verse 5, and hope does not disappoint or does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Right? God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Right? So the same love that the Father has, this, this, this love that characterizes as as it says in 1 John, that God is love, that love is poured into you and me if we're sons and daughters of God. But if we're followers of Christ, that same love has been poured into us through the Holy Spirit. And then slide down a little bit farther in Romans 5. Romans 5, verse 8, says this, But God shows his love for us. He demonstrates it again. It just Paul reminds his readers in Romans, he goes, look, God showed us his love. Verse 8, he says, God showed his love for us that while we were still sinners... While we were still enemies, while we weren't lovable at all, Christ died for us. Like, the Father's like, look, I have no need. I don't Because most of us in this room maybe would struggle to love our enemies, right? It's not the easiest thing to do, right? We maybe struggle to love one another. <laughs> and yet you want me to say, oh, you know what, now I need to go love my enemies too? Yes, that's God's standard. Right? God demonstrates it here. He says it, right? Like, while we were still enemies, while we were still sinners, while we were still lost on the other side in darkness, he sends his son to die. That's how God shows his love for you and me. And we need to let that reality sink in and penetrate and continue to move in and allow it to push out these truths that, you know, God really doesn't love me. What else does he have to do to show you? What else can he do to demonstrate his love for us? And this is the importance of taking, maybe taking some of these verses this week and maybe meditating on them, asking the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what is it that I'm struggling with to receive about the Father's love? And then just focus on that and allow that truth to penetrate. Right? And ask the Holy Spirit to go, you know, change my heart. I, I, I do believe that God loves me. Yes, I, I, I'm sinful. Yes, the enemy is telling me that, you know, God, how can God possibly love you? Look at what you've done. And then he goes, no, that's not true. My Father loves me. And I'm going to let that continue to penetrate into my heart and to my soul. Ephesians chapter 2. Right over to the book of Ephesians. Go a little bit to the right. A few books. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And I have it titled in here in mine anyways, right? That his love leads to mercy. Ephesians 2, starting in verse 4. Verses 1 through 3 tells about who we were again. We were dead in trespasses and sins. We followed the, the, the prince of the air. We were stuck on the opposite side of God's kingdom. And then verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Right? So, by God, but God, rich in mercy, because of what? Why did he show mercy towards you and me? Because of his great love that he had. Because of this agape love that goes, I want the highest good for these people. I want them to know me. I want them to be in relationship with me. There's the highest good. And he goes, but God rakes in with mercy because of his love for you and me. And he makes us alive. He, he realizes that, was, that we were dead in our trespasses and sin. And he's molded us and shaped us back out of that. Unless we think God's love is only spoken of in the New Testament. Let's go to the book of Psalms. God's love is steadfast. I think this is one of the best things for me, is that his love is steadfast. It doesn't change. Like God's love isn't fickle. <laughs> like God's love isn't, you know, high one day and low another day. His love never changes. Right? He, he, he's solid and he can be trusted and his love can be trusted on an ongoing basis. Psalm 36. And we'll start to see this in several of the Psalms. It's a, it's a common theme in the book of Psalms about God's steadfast love. Psalm 36, verse 7. And this is a challenge for us. How precious is his steadfast love? I mean, we could slide up to verse 5. Your, your, your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast that you save, O Lord. Verse 7. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delight. And so, do we believe that God's love is steadfast? 
Do we rest in the fact that God's love never is going to change? Right? If he's poured out his love into you, his love is there. He can't do anything more. Right? He's going to continue to pour that out. Do we trust that it's steadfast? Do you take delight in his steadfast love? Do you ponder the truth that goes, man, oh man, right? I, I know maybe I don't experience that kind of love here. Right? But God, I, I, let me experience that on a consistent basis. Your steadfast love. Slide it a little bit over to the right. Go to Psalm 86, and we're going to see the same thing again. Psalm 86. God's love is steadfast. Psalm 86, verse 15. We already saw these characteristics of what Paul says in, in Ephesians. It says this, But you, O Lord, are God, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Abounding in steadfast love. Right? There is no limit. Right? He pours it out and we're like, oh, I can't take it anymore. He goes, well, here's more. And he continues to pour it out. And right? how much do you need? Right? Well, I need more of your, God, of your love, God. He goes, okay, well, then I'll give you more of my love. Do you want it? Right? So he's like, I'll, I'll give you more. I'll let you experience more of it. But he's not going to continue to do it. Right? Right? Some of it's on our hunger side. We have a hunger for that. We have a desire to experience in that. And then you could slide a little bit farther again, and you could read it in Psalm 109, 26. You could go a little bit farther and read about his steadfast love again in Psalm 136, 26. And then and if you were to read through the through the books of Psalms, you know, the book of Psalms all the way through, you would see that repeated theme again and again and again of God's steadfast love towards you and me. And so there's God's love for us. There's this love, there's the extreme and the in the in the perfect example of what love looks like father laying down his son's life and a son following that and that's where we're going to go next jesus demonstrates this love right so the father has this love and he sends his son jesus could have gone you know what uh, nah, i don't want to do that right I, God, father you know i'm I, you know I'm, I'm really busy i don't want to go down and i don't want to give up my rights but I, he's obedient in perfect obedience to his father because he knows his father loves him and he says I, i'll do anything for you father you love me in this way I'm going to love that way. And he goes and he models that. Flip with me to the book of 1 John. 1 John 3.16. I think it's a, a coincidence as we go through that. Right? John 3.16. For God so loved the world, right? That he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And then John, right? He comes in his, in his first epistle, his first letter, in 1 John 3.16. And he goes, by this we know love. <laughs> by what? Right? He leaves it very clear. He leaves no questions. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. What's love? A laid down life. Self-sacrificing. Not putting my needs above your needs. It's laying my life down. It's you laying your life down for other people. That's how we know what love is. That's what Jesus did. He, he demonstrated the ultimate example of that. And then if you want to slide back, so we know what love is, right? Christ laying down his life, going to the cross. We see the example of that love there at the cross. But go to John, the, back to the gospel. John chapter 13. Give you a, a chance to get there. John chapter 13. Right? The, Jesus and his disciples are in the upper room. He talks about the fact that he's going to be betrayed. He's just washed the disciples' feet. Here's Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, humbling himself, becoming a man, and he takes on the lowliest form of a servant. And I don't know about you, but this all became real life. Right? Washing feet became real to me, right? on, at least on a small scale, of what it means to wash feet when we were in Mozambique. We were in Mozambique at the time, and there was all the international students at, a, at, the, at the Iris school. And then the Iris had a, a school for native you know, pastors that were there as well. And these native pastors, most of them didn't have shoes. Some of them may have had sandals, maybe, right? And so they would, they would walk miles for the schooling every day. And over there, there wasn't the best sanitation. Right? You would walk over open sewer at times. I mean, and so we had a, a day one time where they asked us, and they, and they brought us as a teaching, and they had said, okay, all the native pastors lined up on the altar, and they had us as international students come and wash their feet. And I'm going to tell you, right, they're not American feet, church. They're, they're feet that are, are, are <laughs> you look at them like, wow. I didn't think feet could be that bad. I didn't think feet could be that dirty. And my guess is these ones are actually taking care of themselves better than some. Right? 
And so their, their feet, and Jesus took himself, and he goes, you know what? He's sitting there in the, in, the, in the dinner table, right? And he's like, nobody's washing his feet. He goes, do I have to show you again what love looks like? Let me, let me, let me, let me put the apron on myself. And he goes and he washes their feet. And he gets them back to the table and he explains this example. And then we come to verse 34 and 35 of, first, of John chapter 13. And this is commandment is based off of that truth. Right? And this commandment is based off of what he's just done for them. When he had gone out, this, that being Jesus, or Judas, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified. And God, God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, let little... Yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I say also to you, where I am going, you cannot come. Verse 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. So he takes this commandment, and it's a commandment that still is impactful upon us still today as his church, as his bride. Right? You are to love one another, but how are we to love one another? Just as Christ loved us. What did it take? How did, God, how did Christ demonstrate his love for you? Where did he pull you out of? What dirtiness did he wash out of your life when you came to him? Right, where were you sitting at the time when he found you and he goes, man, child, you're filthy. You're dirty. Right, your, 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 sin is, is, your sin's stained. I want to wash you. Will you allow me to wash you? Right, where did he meet you? How did he demonstrate that truth? He goes, Here's what I have done. I've demonstrated to you what it looks like to love is to take the lowliest form of a servant and to, and to, and to wash your feet and to, to care for you and to love you. Love like that. I just want to encourage you, right? Think about where Jesus met you in that moment of your dirt and your grind and what he pulled you out of and how he washed you clean. And then he says, go ahead and love other people in that same way. And we're going to look at that command 35 here in a little bit as we get into the fact that love is commanded of you and me. Right, so Jesus had just loved them by washing their feet and then eventually going to the cross. Right, he, he, he lays this example out before us. And so then John, flip over a little bit farther, go to John chapter 15. And we looked at this, this chapter quite in depth last week about the vine and the branches and the cutting away and the pruning. And I pray that some of you maybe were pruned this week. Right, and that if you were pruned, that while it may have hurt, you're starting to see that maybe there's some fruitfulness coming out of that pruning. Right, and so pruning is a good thing. Right, getting yourself cut and trimmed in places means that you're bearing some fruit, and God wants you to bear more fruit. Right? So pruning is a, is a benefit. But if you slide over to John 15, look at his commandment again in verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Right? Jesus doesn't tell you and I to love one another without giving us the example. And he reminds us of that all the time. Love one another as I loved you. Right, go back, remind yourself, how did Jesus love me? And then let that be the motivator of how you're going to love others. Don't just get it in your session going, oh, pastor told me I need to go love people this week, so I'm just going to get at it and I'm going to go love people. It's not going to work. I'm telling you. It's not. At least not long term. It might work in the immediate term. Right? We can self-will it for a little while. But we need to be reminded of the fact that Jesus loved us in this way and he demonstrated and us both will lay down our lives for other people that we come in contact with. And slide down into verse 13 a little bit farther, right? This is how we, this is my command, you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than someone lay down his life for his friend. Are we willing to lay down our lives for one another, church? Right, there's the epitome of love, laying down your life. He goes, there's no greater love than this, than to lay your life down for friends. Right? And as I said before, most of us in this room right now are not going to probably ever have to lay down our physical life for one another. Probably not. Right? Not saying we won't, because we may have to at some point. Right? But, I mean, the chances are we're not going to end up laying down our lives for one another physically. But we are going to have to lay down our lives to sacrifice time, resources, right? whatever other small ways, right? As I used to, I like the example of, you know, you have a stack of quarters, and it's like, give your life away one quarter at a time. You might not ask for your whole thing. But it's like, there's all these little things throughout your day-to-day -day life where you can lay your life down. Where you can die to yourself, that others might grow, and others might be lifted up in their faith. And then the last one in this portion of Jesus demonstrates love, a reminder is in Galatians 2.20. 
right? Jesus gave himself for you and me. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Apostle Paul, talk about being justified by faith. He comes in in verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Is that the image of your life? Right? I live my life for the sake of Christ, who loved me and gave himself up. It's no longer me who lives. Christ indwells me, and he does. The Holy Spirit, right, the, the, the Spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in each one of us if we're in Christ, right? And he, and he indwells us, and he goes, I want that truth. I want that inner life to come out in the outer life. Right? Are we allowing that fruit to grow? Are we allowing that character of Christ to grow? I pray that we are, and, and I've seen it in different areas, and I've seen it in different people's lives where some of this fruit is growing, and it's flourishing, and I encourage you to continue to let that go. But if you're sitting there going, no, you know what? The spirit of love just isn't really in me very much. And ask, Father, would you prune me? I want love to grow in my life. I want the character of Christ to grow. And so that leads us to our response to all this. Right? So our Father shows us love. Jesus demonstrates that love in a, in, a, in a real sense by coming to earth and giving up his life for you and me and laying down that life. And then it comes to our love for God. Look with me, if you're in Galatians, go a little bit to the right, and then we're going to go back, but go to 1 John chapter 5. Love looks like something to God. Love is a life that's laid down for him. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. Just in case we wonder what love is, what love for God is. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Right? If we want to say that we love God, if we want to say that we, you know, that He's our everything, that He's our first love, that'll be modeled, that'll be witnessed, that'll be testified to by a life of obedience to what He asks of us. Right? If I say that I love God and I'm living in complete rebellion, or if I'm living in disobedience to the things He asks, question if we really love Him. And that's not me, right? For John, the Apostle John writes it out, right? This is love for Him, that we're obedient to His commands. He's Lord, yes? Well, yeah, but he's, he's Lord of only these parts. I, can't I keep this one? No. Right? He's either Lord of everything or he's Lord of nothing. Now, does that mean that he's perfectly Lord of everything? No, we're growing in those things. But if we dug our heels in and going, God, you can't have that, that's a dangerous spot to be. You can't touch that part of my life. That's mine. I got control of that. I didn't give that to you. He goes, no, 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 that's not true. Right? If, you, if you want my salvation, then it's everything. I didn't die for parts of you. I died for all of you. Right? I died for your entire being. I died for everything that you are. That's what I died for. I adopted you in as my sons and daughters. I want your everything. And so there's areas we can grow in our obedience, obviously. None of us is perfectly obedient to the things he asks, but that's our desire, or at least it should be if we truly love God. Then, like I said, go back to the Gospel of John, and we're going to see this truth reiterated again. John chapter 14. Right, so here's the Apostle John. He's writing to his readers, and we're like, well, where did he get that from? Well, he's listening to Jesus, no? He's walking with Jesus. He was in the inner circle with Jesus, right? There was, there's John, right, who's like the innermost, and he's sitting there at the crucifixion, right? The disciple whom Jesus loved, if you will, right, that's in there. But he was in that inner circle with James and Peter and, you know, the three of them were kind of those that were in tight with Jesus, right? They were kind of that inner circle, if you will, that Jesus had of relationships, right? Then he has the 12 and then he has the, you know, the circles continue to go out. But John's in this inner circle and John tells his, his readers, here, this is what it looks like. And he goes, well, where did he get that from? John chapter, ooh, where did they just say? John chapter 14, Jesus says in verse 15, if you love me, you will what? Keep my commandments. Right? Jesus looks at his disciples and goes, look, guys, right? if, you, if you love me, you'll obey me. You'll keep my commands. You'll walk in my way. Don't tell me you'll love me if you're not going to listen to me. Because I don't know if it's true. Right? And my guess is it's the same thing with us in relationships. 
don't tell me you love me if it's not modeled, because I don't know I, what, what leads me to believe that that's true. Well, I really love you. Hmm. Okay. Right? And some things happen, and maybe we, we do things that aren't very godly, aren't very Christ-like, aren't very loving, and we're like, that's not love. Oh, no, but I really love you. <laughs> no, sorry. Right? Love doesn't do that to people. Right? Love doesn't walk out. Love doesn't do these. Love doesn't do that. But don't stop telling me you love me. Demonstrate it. Show me you love me. Prove you love me. Right? Make your words match your actions. That's what Jesus is asking. Not even asking. He's commanding in that grace. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Not you might keep my commandments. Not if you feel like keeping my commandments. He goes, you will keep my commandments. You'll walk in my ways, period. And you go, well, is that the only time Jesus says it? No, slide a little bit farther down. Verse 23 just in case it's there, you know, in case we didn't catch it the first time. Jesus is like, you know, Jesus answered him. If anyone loves me, verse 23, he will keep my word. And my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. <laughs> right? Whoever does not love me doesn't keep my words. So Jesus doesn't mince words, does he? Jesus is like, look. If you love me, you'll keep them. If you don't love me, you're not going to keep them. So if I'm not keeping them, if you're not keeping them, what does it say about our love for God? What does it say about our love for Christ? Right? Maybe it's that I don't love him, period. Or maybe you know there is this thing of, of growing in that obedience again, like I say, but is there a heart's desire to obey? Right? Do we desire to grow in that? No desire? I question if your love is real. So should you. Right? If there's no desire to obey, then i I, I, I got to sit and look and go, that's not godly love. That's not love for Christ at all. Right? And so our love for God is supposed to be obedience to the things he asks of us and that he commands of us. And that's why he tells us, I believe in the Great Commission. Right? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And what? Teaching them to obey. Because if we're teaching them to obey, that means basically what we're saying is we're teaching them to love God. No? As we take the Great Commission, like we're just teaching them to obey. No, really what we're doing by doing that is we're teaching them to love God. We're teaching them to demonstrate their love for Christ. That's what we're doing. We're leading them into a love relationship by teaching them to obey. It's not just a bunch of rules we're asking them to maintain. They have enough, we have enough of those, don't we? We have enough rules we have to maintain and keep. Right? But he's like, no, no, what I want you to do is I want you to love me. Teach them to love me. What does that look like? It looks like obedience to my commands. Fly back to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 22. Our love for God is supposed to be everything. Matthew chapter 22. This is a, the portion of the great commandments that come into play. And the Pharisees are challenging him. And when the Pharisees heard in verse 34, when the, when the Pharisees had heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Right? Which is the greatest? And what does he tell him in verse 37? He said to him, this is Jesus, mind you. He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. What does that leave out? Anything? Does that leave any area of our lives off base to loving Him? No. Right, we're to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. Period. That means everything that's sitting here right now, everything that you are right now, is to love God. Is to walk in obedience to the things He asks. Is to make the most of everything that He is, to bring glory, praise, and honor to His name. That everything that we do with our lives is to love Him. And to show that love. What a challenge it is, right? What a, what, a, what a conviction that is for me, right? To speak it and allow the word to come in and go, John, do you love him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Well, I, you know, he's got, you know, 80% in this area right now. Uh, no, 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 that isn't what he asked for. He asked for all of it. What's holding you back from giving all of it right now? Well, but God, you know, these, these things are going on and these things are happening in my life and I just, I can't give it to you right now. He's like, really? Okay. Right? Well, 
that, that wasn't what I asked. I asked for everything. And so there's why our love of God is supposed to be demonstrated is with everything we have. And lest we think that that's a new commandment, right? Lest we think that that's something that Jesus is like just kind of made up as in this day and age. Slide back to the Old Testament. Go to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6. We just heard, read from Jesus saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Right? And here we have the, the Jews that are in the midst of travels and, and living life and delivered by God. And we come to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Still here a few pages turn until I let you get there. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verse 5. Actually, we'll go to verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Verse 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and you shall talk with them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your head and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Right? Jesus says, you know, the, the, the Lord is writing to the Jews and he's like, look, you shall love me with everything you got. You go, what does that look like? He goes, you know what? Talk about it all the time. All the time. And we just talked about this that Wednesday night on this, at our discipleship group, the same set of verses, right? About how we're supposed to be intimate and, and intentional. And he's like, I don't care what you need to do. Right? These commands I'm putting before you should be on your mind all the time. You've got to write them on the doorpost, write them on the doorpost. Right? My guess is most of us don't have anything written on our doorpost when we leave our houses, is, is my guess. Right? But this could look like a sticky note on your rear view mirror in your car. Right? There's a simple way to practice the disciplines, right? Just write a sticky note and stick it on, you know, on your rear view mirror. How many times do we look in our rear view mirrors? Quite often, probably, when we drive, right? And it can just be a little sticky note of something that the, the Holy Spirit is made aware that we need to work on or that he wants us to, to remember. Right? We can put it there. I, we can put it on our, you know, our bathroom mirrors. We can put a sticky note there. Whatever, right? There's ways to put this ever present before us, not actually engraving it on the doorpost. That's what you need. Then do it. Write it on your doorpost. That's, you know, go for it. That's okay, right? And then, it, I mean, it's an instant conversation starter for anybody who comes into your house. No, if you want to, oh, I struggle to, you know, evangelize. I struggle to bring up the gospel with people. Well, have it on your doorpost, right there in your bathroom. Right? There's a sticky note. Why do you put that sticky note on your bathroom mirror? Let me tell you, I, I, I'm learning this, and the Lord is making this present about me, and I'm trying to put it in and try to capture it, and I'm trying to meditate on it, and so it's an important thing, and now let me tell you about my God. Right, those types of things can be simple tools that are there, but again, Old Testament is the same thing. You shall love the Lord your God with everything. And then he repeats it in Deuteronomy. Slide over to Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy 10:12. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all of his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord which I am commanding you today for your good. Right, so has the expectation of our Father changed to what love looks like to him? Nope. He had the expectation of Israel back then that they would love him with everything. And he says, under the new covenant, under Jesus Christ, right under this relationship, I still expect you to love me with everything. Right? The amazing thing is, the blessing, the, 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 the grace, the favor of our Lord is the fact that in the Old Testament, he goes, go and do these things, right? Love me with everything, and there's no way they could. It wasn't possible. Right? They didn't have the Holy Spirit indwelling them. They didn't have the ability, right? And that was the whole point of the law, was to make them understand that they were in absolute desperate need of a Savior. The amazing thing is that under the New Testament, under the New Covenant, the fact that, we're, that we've been born again, that we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, is we can possibly love Him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's possible. Right? We, that Spirit who's in us is constantly creating that desire to love and obey Him in all things. Right? He's given us the power to live in those things. Something we couldn't do before. But now we have the desire too, because he's constantly creating a hunger and a thirst. And a, I want more of God. Where does that hunger and thirst come from? It's not our hunger and thirst, right? The Spirit's working it in us. 
He's creating it in us. He's, he's constantly stirring that in us to love God with everything. And then we come to the last part. So that's our love for God, right? That, that's, that's, pre, that's supreme, right? The first and greatest commandment. If we're not doing that well, chances are we're not doing this well. And if our lives aren't sacrificed for him, am I going to sacrifice them for you? Eh, probably not. Right? If I can't bring myself to lay my life down for somebody who loved me to the extreme, I'm probably not going to lay my life down for somebody who maybe is my enemy or I don't get along with well or whatever it might be. Right? It's gonna, I'm going to find that connection wrong. But if I'm loving him first and foremost, out of that intimacy, out of that relationship with God, I'll start to love you. And then comes in all the commands. And maybe we have time to read all these this morning. I don't know, but we're going to read some of them. We already read John 13, 35, and 30, 34 and 35, right? This is my command that you love one another as I have loved you. And then he goes on in verse 35. He goes, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Right? So one of the, the, the means of people telling whether you and I are followers of Christ is our love for one another. Right? Not by what we profess, not by what we say, not anything else. But by, you know, Not that those aren't important. We need to profess right, but it's our love for one another. It's the practical outworkings of that with one another. Now, people are going to look and go, yeah, they're, they, they're, there's something going on here. They're not normal. And we shouldn't be. Right? The world should be able to tell that we're followers of Christ. They should be able to go, wow, there's something that's not normal about you. The world doesn't live like this. The world doesn't love like this. The world doesn't lay down their lives for other people. It's all about stepping on people's lives to get ahead. And yet here are these, this, these, these group of people that are laying their lives down so that other people can elevate. People take notice of that, and they show it. Right? There's the body of Christ growing in that love. And then in John chapter 15, so if you're in the Gospel of John, John chapter 15, again, we read this command just a little bit ago. Verse, verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Right? And so the challenge is, okay, so if love for God is what? Obedience to his commands. And he just told us to what? Love one another as he has loved us. How are we doing? Right? Instant self-check. How am I doing? How am I loving you? Right? Am, I, am I laying my life down for you? Are you laying your life down for other people? Or is your life all about me? What I want, what I need, what I desire. What? If that's the case, then we need to check ourselves. Right? Jesus says, I love, love one another as I have loved you. And then you can go to the book of 1 John, and you can see it repeated. 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. From the beginning. My guess is that when we came to Christ, when you entered the church, right, this is something that you've heard, is that we're supposed to love one another. This message hasn't changed. The question is, is are we changing? Are we growing in that? Are we now proclaiming that same message? That we're to love one another. And then as we saw in verse 16 of 1 John chapter 3, right, we said, by this we know what love is, that Christ laid down his life for us. Right? We ought to also lay down our lives for our brothers. And then John goes and explains what that looks like. Like I said a moment ago, right? most of us aren't going to ask to lay down our physical lives. But look at what verse 17 and 18 say in 1 John chapter 3. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? How many of us have the world's goods? How many of us have the world's goods? Right? We all do. Right? We have the world's goods. We all probably have more than we need. Let's be honest. Right? Well, no, 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 wait a minute. No, no, no. Right? I, I need this, this security blanket over here. Maybe. Right? I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not saying we shouldn't have retirement. I'm not... But you know what? We have more than we need in many instances. We just do. Right? We've been blessed beyond measure, especially in this country. Right? And so he's like, you know, if you have the world's goods and you have the world's things and somebody comes up to you, right, and you see a brother in need and yet you go, ah, not touching that. Somebody else will do that. Right? Somebody else will take care of that. He goes, how can the love of God be in you? How is that possible? 
right? And that doesn't mean that everything that we see, every need that is there that we're supposed to meet. I'm not saying that, you know, we're supposed to give everything away. Maybe you're supposed to, right? God drowns the rich young ruler, right? Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me, right? Because money had a hold on his heart, right? All of a sudden, the worldly possessions had that young man's heart at the moment in time. And you know what? I'm going to challenge you now. If the world has your possessions and the world has your heart, get ready for him to ask you because he's done it to me. Right? The world had my heart, whatever, 20 years ago. Right? And I was pursuing the, the American dream. I had all of those things. I had, all, I mean, I had it all from my perspective, from a world's perspective. Great job, great house, you know, I mean, cars, I, knew I had it. The problem is, is I thought I had it. What it did is, is it was the reverse. It actually had me. It was driving the things I did. Right? That was what made my decisions. Was this a benefit to me? Did it build my retirement? Did it do this? Did it advance me in the world? What did it do? And then God comes along and goes, oh, by the way, right? Rich young ruler, go read it. I'm like, really, God, you want me to sell everything? That ain't going to go well. <laughs> right? That ain't going to go well at all. You know, that's not the way it's done here, God. I, I, I'm coming to church. I'm pleasing you. I'm doing these things. But I'm not giving everything. Sorry. Right? And so I fought with him for a while, and then I used my wife as an excuse. Well, she's not going to be on board with that idea. Right? We bought this farm right, for her in some regards, for us. Right? This was the plan. He's like, well, go ask her. Go tell her what I told you. I'm like, oh, boy. Okay, whatever. All right, you know what? Hey, Mary, I, can we have a conversation? I need to talk with you about something. You know, we've been talking about this, and you know, the Lord brought the scripture up, and she goes, well, what are we waiting for? I'm like, that's not the answer I wanted. Right? That, that wasn't the way it was supposed to work. But, you know, but this is the truth, church. We've all been blessed beyond measure. Are we using those resources to, to benefit other people, to help other people in need? Chances are, if you've seen need of people, neighbors, brothers, sisters, coworkers, if you've seen them, the Holy Spirit's probably got a way to help you, to enable you, or you have the resources to meet those needs in some fashion. Right, the question is, is are you just going to obey that or not? Are you willing to step into it or not? And too often we step back and go, eh. And then James it says even something more about that in James chapter 2, right? And anybody comes to you and says, you know, I have, I have a need of clothes or food, and you go and say, you know what? Go on your way, you'll be well kept, you know, be warm and well kept, well fed. He goes, that's not faith. Right? Does that kind of faith save you? No. Right? And so works, right, obedience proves our faith and proves our love. The question is, are we walking in those things? And so then he says in verse 18, right, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. Right? Deed and truth. Right? Our word and our talk needs to match what we do. Really and truthfully it does. Right? It's time for us to stop speaking words of how much we love each other and actually show it by our deeds that we love each other. Right, there's the opportunity that's laid out before us all the time. Right, we have constant opportunities to show and demonstrate our love. Right? We see that happening in spots, and it just needs to continue to flourish. Right? God needs to continue to prune us so that it grows in our body. That control continues to grow in our individual lives. Right? And we're like, oh, God, I don't want pruning. Well, guess what? Pruning is necessary so that we can grow in those things. Continue on in the Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. Same thing, right? We love, right? It's commanded to love. We ought to live in love. Um, Colossians 3, 14. Um, flip with me to Romans chapter 12. I'm just kind of skipping through. You can do some of these for reading for homework. I just want to get through the love side of it here. First Corinthians, or Romans chapter 12, rather. Romans 12, verse 9. Romans 12, verse 9. Lo let love be what? Genuine. Sincere. Without wax. Right? No showing, no nothing. That, let your love be real. Let it be genuine. And he continues on. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Right? This is the way we're supposed to live our lives, church. Increasingly so. We're supposed to grow in that kind of love towards one another and in our obedience to it. And then the last one, if you're still in the book of Romans, slide over to Romans 13. Romans 13, verse 8. Romans 13, 8. Owe no one anything. It's 
step to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Right? Owe nothing but to love one another. There's a never-ending debt, if you will, of needing to love one another. Right? Loving God and loving others, I, I, I mean, we'll never fulfill that. It should be the, that should be the aim of our life, is to continuously love people and to serve people and to lay our lives down for one another. Which brings us to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13, and then we'll close with this. Obviously, it's the love chapter. It's read at weddings, and I've read it at weddings, and I always try to make a point of reading at weddings that this, this, this verse, this, this chapter, while it's all about love, it was written to a church that was having issues. It was written to a church that wasn't really loving each other very well. There was arguments, and there was fractions, and there was disagreements, and there was, I mean, it was life in a church. Right? They didn't all see things together, and we don't necessarily always see things eye to eye either. We come from all different backgrounds, all different religion, and you know, all different um, denominations. I mean, we may not always see things the same. And so there's some of this, you know, maybe some friction going on. And Paul goes, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. Right? 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move, remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. And then he gives us this, this lovely little list, right, that we could put our name in the place of, because if we put God in the place of love, right, God is what? God is love. If we put God in front of all these, God fits. If we put Jesus in front of all these, Jesus fits. If I put my name in front of all these, I don't fit so well. At least not all the time. Sometimes I do, right? Verse 4, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Right? It never ends. It never stops. And in, in um, Jerry Bridges' study, and then takes these verses and he kind of shifts them a little bit, if you will, into some, um, I, I, I'd hate to say motivational phrases, but kind of a reasonings behind this, right? And love being that reasoning of why we're patient and why we're kind and why we're these things, right? And he says, he puts it this way, and I'm just going to read these off to you and then we'll close out in prayer. He goes, if First Corinthians 13 is in terms of motivational statements, they might sound something like this. I am patient with you because I love you and want to forgive you. I am kind to you because I love you and want to help you. I do not envy your possessions or your gifts because I love you and want you to have the best. I do not boast about my attainments because I love you and want to hear about yours. Right? Does that typify you? I want to hear about what's going on in your life. I want to hear about your boasts. I don't boast about mine. I want to hear about you. What's going on? But I'm not proud because I love you and want to esteem you before myself. I am not rude because I love you and care about your feelings. I'm not self-seeking because I love you and want to meet your needs. I'm not easily angered by you because I love you and want to overlook your offenses. I do not keep a record of your wrongs because I love you and love covers a multitude of sins. Right? And so when we start to look at those things in those regards of why we're patient, it's because I love you. Right? And because we love other people, I can be patient and I can be kind and I can be, you know, all of those things. But it's, the question is, again, is, is that fruit welling up in you? Are you being intentional about bearing that fruit? That we are we being diligent of going, I'm going to practice these things so that my love continues to grow. Paul tells the Thessalonians, the first Thessalonians four nine, right? I know you're loving people, but let it continue to grow. Right? Do it more and more every day. Right? I know we're loving each other. I know that. Right? There is there's many different instances of love taking place in the body of Christ here at the fellowship. Let it continue to grow. Let it continue to flourish. Let it continue to take even a greater evidence and presence in our lives. Because it's supposed to. And with that, let's go ahead and close out in prayer. Father God, we just, I thank you for your love for us, Father, and you being so loving that you showed it, that you didn't just speak it, you didn't just write it, you actually showed us love by sending your Son. 
And Jesus, we thank you for demonstrating that love by being willing to go to the cross, by being willing to lay down your life. And as we read through the Gospels, we see instance after instance of places where you laid your life down in little ways, in ministry and in life. And then you ultimately showed it on going to the cross and laying down your life for us. I pray, Father, that you would continue to work this into our lives personally and as a body here at Hope Fellowship. Holy Spirit, that you would continue to bear this fruit in each one of us. That if there's areas of our lives that have maybe not been so fruitful, you would cut those things off. Um, You would prune us and you would shape us and mold us and allow us to be more fruitful. That our love would overflow. That our our love for you would be um, first and foremost. And out of that relationship, we would love one another in an increasing fashion. We would lay down our lives in in sacrifice for the betterment of one another. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray.